Chapter Nineteen of The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording done by Jules Harlock of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale by francis marion crawford chapter nineteen what is it asked the nun noticing unorna's sudden movement nothing the name of beatrice is familiar to me that is all it suggested something though sister paul was an unworldly as five-and-twenty years of cloistered life can make a woman who is naturally simple in mind and devout in thought she possessed the faculty of quick observation which is learned as readily and exercised perhaps as constantly in the midst of a small community where each member is in some measure dependent upon all the rest for the daily pittance of ideas as in wider spheres of life you may have seen this lady or you may have heard of her she said i would like to see her unorna answered thoughtfully she was thinking of all the possibilities in the case she remembered the clearness and precision of the wanderer's first impression when he first told her how he had seen beatrice in the tien kirch and she reflected that the name was a very uncommon one the beatrice of his story too had a father and no other relation and was supposed to be travelling with him but the uncertain light in the corridor unorna had not been able to distinguish the lady's features but the impression she had received had been that she was dark as beatrice was there was no reason in the nature of things why this should not be the woman whom the wanderer loved it was natural enough that being left alone in a strange city at such a moment she should have sought refuge in a convent and this being admitted it followed that she was naturally had been advised to retire to one in which unorna found herself it being the one in which ladies were most frequently received as guests unorna could hardly trust herself to speak she was conscious that sister paul was watching her and she turned her face from the lamp there can be no difficulty about your seeing her or talking with her if you wish it said the nun she told me that she would be at the compline at nine o'clock if you were there yourself you can see her come in and watch her when she goes out do you think you have ever seen her no answered unorna in an odd tone i am sure that i have not sister paul concluded from unorna's manner that she must have reason to believe that the guest was identical with someone of whom she had heard very often her manner was abstracted and she seemed ill at ease but that might be the result of fatigue are you not hungry asked the nun you have had nothing since you came i am sure no yes it is true answered unorna i had forgotten it would be very kind of you to send me something sister paul rose with alacrity to unorna's great relief i will see to it she said holding out her hand we shall meet in the morning good night good night dear sister paul will you say a prayer for me she added the question suddenly by an impulse of which she was hardly conscious indeed i will with all my heart my dear child answered the nun looking earnestly into her face you are not happy in your life she added with a slow sad movement of her head no i am not happy but i will be i fear not said sister paul almost under her breath as she went out softly unorna was left alone she could not sit still in her extreme anxiety it was agonizing to think that the woman she longed to see was so near her 
but that she could not upon any reasonable pretext go and knock at her door and see her and speak to her she felt also the terrible doubt as to whether she would recognize her at first sight as the same woman whose shadow had passed between herself and the wanderer on that eventful day a month ago the shadow had been veiled but she had a prescient consciousness of the features beneath the veil nevertheless she might be mistaken it would be necessary to seek her acquaintance by some excuse and endeavour to draw from her some portion of her story enough to confirm unorna's suspicions or to prove conclusively that they were unfounded to do this unorna herself needed all her strength and coolness and she was glad when a lay sister entered the room bringing her evening meal there were moments when unorna in favourable circumstances was able to sink into the so-called state of second sight by an act of volition and she wished now that she could close her eyes and see the face of the woman who was only separated from her by two or three walls but that was not possible in this case to be successful she would have needed some sort of guiding thread or she must have already known the person she wished to see she could not command that inexplicable condition as she could dispose of her other powers at all times and in almost all moods she felt that if she were at present capable of falling into the trance state at all her mind would wander uncontrolled in some other direction there was nothing to be done but to have patience the lay sister went out unorna ate mechanically what had been set before her and waited she felt that a crisis perhaps more terrible than that through which she had lately passed was at hand if the stranger should prove to be indeed the beatrice whom the wanderer loved her brain was in a whirl when she thought of being brought face to face with the woman who had been before her and every cruel and ruthless instinct of her nature rose and took shape in plans for her rival's destruction she opened her door careless of the draught of frozen air that rushed in from the corridor she wished to hear the lady's footsteps when she left her room to go to the church and she sat down and remained motionless fearing lest her own footfall should prevent the sound from reaching her the heavy toned bells began to ring far off in the night at last it came the opening of a door the slight noise made by a light tread upon the pavement she rose quietly and went out following in the same direction she could see nothing but a dark shadow moving before her towards the opposite end of the passage farther and farther from the hanging lamp unorna could hear her own heart beating as she followed first to the right then to the left there was another light at this point the lady had noticed that someone was coming behind her and turned her head to look back the delicate dark profile stood out clearly unorna held her breath walking swiftly forward but in a moment the lady went on and entered the chapel-like room from which a great balconied window looked down into the church above the choir as unorna went in she saw her kneeling upon one of the stools her hands folded her head inclined her eyes closed a black veil loosely thrown over her still blacker hair and falling down upon her shoulder without hiding her face unorna sank upon her knees compressing her lips to restrain the incoherent exclamation that almost broke from them in spite of her clasping her hands desperately so that the faint blue veins stood out upon the marble surface below hundreds of candles blazed upon the altar in the choir and sent their full yellow radiance up to the faces of the two women as they knelt there almost side by side both young both beautiful but utterly unlike in a single glance unorna had understood that it was true at arm's length separated from her 
from the rival whose very existence made her own happiness an utter impossibility with unchanging unwilling gaze she examined every detail of that beauty which the wanderer had so loved that even when forgotten there was no sight in his eyes for other women it was indeed such a face as a man would find it hard to forget unorna seeing the reflection of it in the wanderer's mind had fancied it otherwise though she could not but recognize the reality from the impression she had received she had imagined it more ethereal more faint more sexless more angelic and she had seen it in her thoughts divine it was but womanly beyond unorna's own dark delicately aquiline tall and noble the purity it expressed was of earth and not of heaven it was not transparent for there was life in every feature it was sad indeed almost beyond human sadness but it was sad with the mortal sorrows of this world not with the unfathomable melancholy of a suffering saint the lips were human womanly pure and tender but not formed for speech of prayer alone the drooping lids not drawn but darkened with faint uneven shadows by the flow of many tears were slowly lifted now and again disclosing a vision of black eyes not meant for endless weeping nor made so deep and warm only to strain their sight towards heaven above forgetting earth below unorna knew that those same eyes could gleam and flash and blaze with love and hate and anger that under the rich pale skin the blood could rise and ebb with the changing tide of the heart the warm lips could part with passion and moving form words of love she saw pride in the wide sensitive nostrils strength in the even brow and queenly dignity in the perfect poise of the head upon the slender throat and the clasped hands were womanly too neither full and white and heavy like those of a marble statue as unorna's were nor thin and oversensitive like those of a holy woman in old pictures but real and living delicate in outline but not without nervous strength hands that might linger in another's not wholly passive but all responsive to the thrill of a loving touch it was very hard to bear a better woman than unorna might have felt something evil and cruel and hating in her heart at the sight of so much beauty in one who held her place in the queen of the kingdom where she longed to reign unorna's cheek grew very pale and her unlike eyes were fierce and dangerous it was well for her that she could not speak to beatrice then for she wore no mask and the dark beauty would have seen the danger of death in the face of the fair and would have turned and defended herself in time but the sweet singing of the nuns came softly up from below echoing to the groined roof rising and falling high and low and the full radiance of the many waxen tapers shone steadily from the great altar gilding and warming statue and cornice and ancient moulding and casting deep shadows into all the places that it could not reach and still the two women knelt in their high balcony the one wrapped in fervent prayer the other wondering that the presence of such hatred as hers should have no power to kill and all the time making a supreme effort to compose her own features into the expression of friendly sympathy and interest which she knew she would need so soon as the singing ceased and it was time to leave the church again the psalms were finished there was a pause and then the words of the ancient hymn floated up to unorna's ears familiar in years gone by almost unconsciously she herself by force of old habit joined in the first verse then suddenly she stopped not realizing indeed the horrible gulf that lay between the words that passed her lips and the thoughts that were at work in her heart but silenced by the near sound of a voice less rich 
and full but far more exquisite and tender than her own beatrice was singing too with joined hands and parted lips and upturned face let dreams be far and phantasms of the night bind thou our foe sang beatrice in long sweet notes unerna heard no more the light dazzled her and the blood beat in her heart it seemed as though no prayer that was ever prayed could be offered up more directly against herself and the voice that sang it though not loud had a rare power of carrying every syllable distinctly in its magic tones even to a great distance as she knelt it was as if beatrice had been even nearer and had breathed the words into her very ear afraid to look round lest her face should betray her emotion unorna glanced down at the kneeling nuns she started sister paul alone of them all was looking up her faded eyes fixed on unorna's with a look that implored and yet despaired her clasped hands a little raised from the low desk before her most evidently offering up the words with the whole fervent intention of her pure soul as an intercession for your Narna's sins for one moment the strong cruel heart almost wavered not through fear but under the nameless impression that sometimes takes holds of men and women the divine voice beside her seemed to dominate the hundred voices below the nun's despairing look chilled for one instant all her love and all her hatred so that she longed to be alone away from it all and forever but the hymn ended the voice was silent and sister paul's glance turned again towards the altar the moment was past and unorna was again what she had been before then followed the cantissel the voice of the prioress in the versicles after that and the voices of the nuns no longer singing as they had made the responses the creed a few more versicles and responses the short final prayers and all was over from the church below came up the soft sound that many women make when they move silently together the nuns were passing out in their appointed order beatrice remained kneeling a few moments longer crossed herself and then rose at the same moment unorna was on her feet the necessity for immediate action at all costs restored the calm to her face and the tactful skill to her actions she reached the door first and then half turning her head stood aside as though to give beatrice precedence in passing beatrice glanced at her face for the first time and then by a courteous movement of the head signified that unorna should go out first unorna appeared to hesitate beatrice to protest both women smiled a little and unorna with a gesture of submission passed through the doorway she had managed it so well that it was almost impossible to avoid speaking as they threaded the long corridors together unorna allowed a moment to pass as though to let her companion understand the slight awkwardness of the situation and then addressed her in a tone of quiet and natural civility we seem to be the only ladies in retreat she said yes beatrice answered even in that one syllable something of the quality of her thrilling voice vibrated for an instant they walked a few steps farther in silence i am not exactly in retreat she said presently either because she felt that it would be almost rude to say nothing or because she felt her position to be clearly understood i am waiting here for some one who is to come for me it is a very quiet place to rest in said unorna i'm fond of it you often come here perhaps not now answered unorna but i was here for a long time when i was very young by a common instinct as they fell into conversation they began to walk more slowly side by side indeed said beatrice with a slight increase of interest then you were brought up here by the nuns not exactly 
it was a sort of refuge for me when i was almost a child i was left here alone until i was thought old enough to take care of myself there was a little bitterness in her tone intentional but masterly in its truth to nature left by her parents beatrice asked the question seemed almost inevitable i had none i never knew a father or a mother unorna's voice grew sad with each syllable they had entered the great corridor in which their apartments were situated and were approaching beatrice's door they walked more and more slowly in silence during the last few moments after unorna had spoken unorna sighed the passing breath travelling on the air of the lonely place seemed both to invite and to offer sympathy my father died last week beatrice said in a very low tone that was not quite steady i am quite alone here and in the world she laid her hand upon the latch and her deep black eyes rested upon unorna's as though almost but not quite conveying an invitation hungry for human comfort yet too proud to ask it i am very lonely too said unorna may i sit with you for a while she had but just time to make the bold stroke that was necessary in another moment she knew that beatrice would have disappeared within her heart beat violently until the answer came she had been successful will you indeed beatrice exclaimed i am a poor company but i shall be very glad if you will come in she opened her door and unorna entered the apartment was almost exactly like her own in size and shape and furniture but it already had the air of being inhabited there were books upon the table and a square jewel case and an old silver frame containing a large photograph of a stern dark man in middle age beatrice's father as unorna at once understood cloaks and furs lay in some confusion upon the chairs a large box stood with a lid raised against the wall displaying a quantity of lace among which lay silks and ribbons of soft colours i only came this morning beatrice said as though to apologise for the disorder unorna sank down in a corner of the sofa shading her eyes from the bright lamp with her hand she could not help looking at beatrice but she felt that she must not let her scrutiny be too apparent nor her conversation too eager beatrice was proud and strong and could doubtless be very cold and forbidding when she chose and do you expect to be here long unorna asked as beatrice established herself at the other end of the sofa i cannot tell was the answer i may be here but a few days or i may have to stay a month i lived here for years said unorna thoughtfully i suppose it would be impossible now i should die of apathy and inanition she laughed in a subdued way as though respecting beatrice's mourning but i was young then she added suddenly withdrawing her hand from her eyes so that the full light of the lamp fell upon her she chose to show that she too was beautiful and she knew that beatrice had as yet hardly seen her face as they passed through the gloomy corridors it was an instant of vanity and yet for her purpose it was a right one the effect was sudden and unexpected and beatrice looked at her almost fixedly in undisguised admiration young then she said you are young now less young than i was then unorna answered with a little sigh followed instantly by a smile i am five-and-twenty said beatrice woman enough to try and force a confession from her new acquaintance are you i would not have thought it we are nearly of an age quite perhaps for i'm not yet twenty-six but then it's not the years she stopped suddenly beatrice wondered whether unorna were married or not considering the age she admitted and her extreme beauty it seemed probable that she must be 
it occurred to her that the acquaintance had been made without any presentation and that neither knew the other's name since i'm a little the younger she said i shall tell you who i am unorna made a slight movement she was on the point of saying that she knew already and too well i am beatrice varanger i am unorna she could not help a sort of cold defiance that sounded in her tone as she pronounced the only name she could call hers unorna beatrice repeated courteously enough but with an air of surprise yes that is all it seems strange to you they call me so because i was born in february in the month we call unor indeed it is strange and so is my story though it would have little interest for you forgive me you are wrong it would interest me immensely if you would tell me a little of it but i am such a stranger to you i do not feel as though you are that unorna answered with a very gentle smile you are very kind to say so said beatrice quietly unorna was perfectly well aware that it must seem strange to say the least of it that she should tell beatrice the wild story of her life when they had as yet exchanged barely a hundred words but she cared little what beatrice thought provided that she could interest her she had a distinct intention of making the time slip by unnoticed until it should be late she related her history so far as it was known to herself simply and graphically substantially as it had been already set forth but with an abundance of anecdote and comment which enhanced the interest and at the same time extended its limits interspersing her monologues with remarks which called for an answer and which served as tests of her companion's attention she hinted but lightly at her possession of unusual powers over animals and spoke not at all of the influence she could exert upon people beatrice listened eagerly she could have told on her part that for years her own life had been dull and empty and that it was long since she had talked with any one who had so roused her interest at last unorna was silent she had reached the period of her life which had begun a month before that time and at that point her story ended then you are not married beatrice's tone expressed an interrogation and a certain surprise no said unorna i am not married and you if i may ask beatrice started visibly it had not occurred to her that the question might seem a natural one for unorna to ask although she had said that she was alone in the world unorna might have supposed her to have lost her husband but unorna could see that it was not surprise alone that had startled her the question as she knew it must had roused a deep and painful train of thought no said beatrice in an altered voice i am not married i shall never marry a short silent followed during which she turned her face away i have pained you said unorna with profound sympathy and regret forgive me how could i be so tactless how could you know beatrice asked simply not attempting to deny the suggestion but unorna was suffering too she had allowed herself to imagine that in the long years which had passed beatrice might perhaps have forgotten it had even crossed her mind that she might indeed be married but in the few words and in the tremor that accompanied them as well as in the increased pallor of beatrice's face she detected a love not less deep and constant and unforgotten than the wanderer's own forgive me unorna repeated i might have guessed i have loved too she knew that here at least she could not feign and she could not control her voice but with supreme judgment of the effect she allowed herself to be carried beyond all reserve in the one short sentence her whole passion expressed itself 
genuine deep strong ruthless she let the words come as they would and beatrice was startled by the passionate cry that burst from the heart so wholly unrestrained for a long time neither spoke again and neither looked at the other to all appearances beatrice was the first to regain her self-possession and then all at once the words came to her lips which could be restrained no longer for years she had kept silent for there had been no one to whom she could speak for years she had sought him as best she could as he had sought her fruitlessly and at last hopelessly and she had known that her father was seeking him also everywhere that he might drag her to the ends of the earth at the mere suspicion of the wanderer's presence in the same country it had amounted to madness with him of the kind not seldom seen beatrice might marry whom she pleased but not the one man she loved day by day and year by year their two strong wills had been silently opposed and neither the one nor the other had ever been unconscious of the struggle nor had either yielded a hair's breadth but beatrice had been at her father's mercy for he could take her whether he would and in that she could not resist him never in that time had she lost faith in the devotion of the man she sought and at last it was only in the belief that he was dead that she could discover an explanation of his failure to find her still she would not change and still through the years she loved more and more truly and passionately and unchangingly the feeling that she was in the presence of a passion as great as unhappy and as masterful as her own unloosed her tongue such things happen in this strange world men and women of deep and strong feelings outwardly cold reserved taciturn and proud have been known once in their lives to pour out the secrets of their hearts to a stranger or a mere acquaintance as they could never have done to a friend beatrice seemed scarcely conscious of what she was saying or of unorna's presence the words long kept back and sternly restrained fell with a strange strength from her lips and they were not one of them from first to last that did not sheathe itself like a sharp knife in unorna's heart the enormous jealousy of beatrice which had been growing within her besides her love during the last month was reaching the climax of its overwhelming magnitude she hardly knew when beatrice ceased speaking for the words were still all ringing in her ears and clashing madly in her own breast and prompting her fierce nature to do some violent deed but beatrice looked for no sympathy and did not see unorna's face she had forgotten unorna herself at the last and she sat staring at the opposite wall then she rose quickly and taking something from the jewel box thrust it into unorna's hands i cannot tell why i have told you but i have you shall see him too what does it matter we have both loved we are both unhappy we shall never meet again what is it unorna tried to ask holding the closed case in her hands she knew what was within it well enough and her self-command was forsaking her it was almost more than she could bear it was as though beatrice was wreaking vengeance on her instead of her destroying her rival as she had meant to do sooner or later beatrice took the thing from her opened it gazed at it a moment and put it again into unorna's hands it was like him she said watching her companion as though to see what effect the portrait would produce then she shrank back unorna was looking at her her face was livid and unnaturally drawn and the extraordinary contrast in the colour of her two eyes were horribly apparent the one seemed to freeze the other to be on fire 
the strongest and worst passions that can play upon the human soul were all expressed with awful force in the distorted mask and not a trace of the magnificent beauty so lately there was visible beatrice shrank back in horror you know him she cried half guessing at the truth i know him and i love him said unorna slowly and fiercely her eyes fixed on her enemy and gradually leaning towards her so as to bring her face near and near to beatrice the dark woman tried to rise and could not there were worse than anger or hatred or the intent to kill in those dreadful eyes there was a fascination from which no living thing could escape she tried to scream to shut out the vision to raise her hand as a screen before it near and near it came and she could feel the warm breath of it upon her cheek then her brain reeled her limbs relaxed and her head fell back against the wall i know him and i love him were the last words beatrice heard End of chapter nineteen Chapter Twenty of The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Georgia Bondi, London, England, GeorgiaBondi.com. The Witch of Prague, a fantastic tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter Twenty footnote the deeds here recounted are not imaginary not very long ago the sacrilege which anorna attempted was actually committed at night in a catholic church in london under circumstances that clearly provided the intention of some person or persons to defile the consecrated wafers a case of hypnotic suggestion to the committal of a crime in a convent occurred in hungary not many years since with a different object namely a daring robbery but precisely as here described a complete account of the case will be found with authority and evidence in a pamphlet entitled ein experimentale studie auf dem gebiet des hypnotismus by dr r von kraft ebbing professor of psychiatry and for nervous diseases in university of graz second edition stuttgart ferdinand enk eighteen eighty nine it is not possible in a work of fiction to quote learned authorities at every chapter but it may be said here and once for all that all the most important situations have been taken from cases which have come under medical observation within the last few years End of footnote anorna was hardly conscious of what she had done she had not the intention of making beatrice sleep for she had no distinct intention whatever at that moment her words and her look had been but the natural results of overstrained passion and she repeated what she had said again and again and gazed long and fiercely into beatrice's face before she realized that she had unintentionally thrown her rival and enemy into the intermediate state it is rarely that the first stage of hypnotism produces the same consequences in two individuals in beatrice it took the form of total unconsciousness as though she had merely fainted away anorna gradually regained her self-possession after all beatrice had told her nothing which she did not either wholly know or partly guess and her anger was not the result of the revelation but of the way in which the story had been told word after word phrase after phrase had cut her and stabbed her to the quick and when beatrice had thrust the miniature into her hands her wrath had risen in spite of herself but now she had returned to a state in which she could think connectedly and now that she saw beatrice asleep before her she did not regret what she had unwittingly done from the first moment in the balcony over the church where she had realized she was in the presence of the woman she hated she had determined to destroy her 
To accomplish this, she would in any case have used her especial weapons, and though she had intended to steal by degrees upon her enemy, lulling her to sleep by a more gentle fascination, at an hour when the whole convent should be quiet, yet since the first step had been made unexpectedly and without her will, she did not regret it. She leaned back and looked at Beatrice during several minutes, smiling to herself from time to time, scornfully and cruelly. Then she rose and locked the outer door and closed the inner one carefully. She knew from long ago that no sound could then find its way to the corridor without. She came back and sat down again, and again looked at the sleeping face, and she admitted for the hundredth time that evening that Beatrice was very beautiful. If he could see us now, she exclaimed aloud. The thought suggested something to her. She would like to see herself beside this woman and compare the beauty he loved with the beauty that could not touch him. It was very easy. She found a small mirror and set it upon the back of the sofa on a level with Beatrice's head. Then she changed the position of the lamp and looked at herself and touched her hair and smoothed her brow, and loosened the black lace about her white throat. And she looked from herself to Beatrice, and back to herself again, many times. It is strange that black should suit us both so well. She so dark, and I so fair, she said. She will look well when she is dead. She gazed again for many seconds at the sleeping woman. But he will not see her then, she added, rising to her feet and laying the mirror on the table. She began to walk up and down the room, as was her habit, when in deep thought, turning over in her mind the deed to be done and the surest and best way of doing it. It never occurred to her that Beatrice could be allowed to live beyond that night. If the woman had been but an unconscious obstacle in her path, Anorna would have spared her life. But as matters stood, she had no inclination to be merciful. There was nothing to prevent the possibility of a meeting between Beatrice and the Wanderer, if Beatrice remained alive. They were in the same city together, and their parts might cross at any moment. The Wanderer had forgotten, but it was not sure that the artificial forgetfulness would be proof against an actual sight of the woman once so dearly loved. The same consideration was true of Beatrice. She too might be made to forget, though it was always an experiment of uncertain issue and of more than uncertain result, even when successful so far as duration was concerned. Anorna reasoned coldly with herself, recalling all that Keyork Arabian had told her and all that she had read. She tried to admit that Beatrice might be disposed of in some other way, but the difficulties seemed to be insurmountable. To effect such a disappearance, Anorna must find some safe place in which the wretched woman might drag out her existence undiscovered. But Beatrice was not like the old beggar who in its hundredth year had leaned against Anorna's door, unnoticed and uncared for, and had been taken in and had never been seen again. The case was different. The aged scholar, too, had been cared for as he could not have been cared for elsewhere, and in the event of an inquiry being made, he could be produced at any moment, and would even afford a brilliant example of Anorna's charitable doings. But Beatrice was a stranger, and a person of some importance in the world. The Cardinal Archbishop himself had directed the nuns to receive her, and they were responsible for her safety. To spirit her away in the night would be a dangerous thing. Wherever she was to be taken, Anorna would have to lead her there alone. Anorna would herself be missed. Sister Paul already suspected that the name of witch was more than a mere appellation. There would be a search made, and suspicion might easily fall upon Anorna, who would have been obliged, of course, to conceal her enemy in her own house for lack of any other convenient place. There was no escape from the deed. Beatrice must die. 
for Norna could produce death in a form that could leave no trace, and it would be attributed to a weakness of the heart. Does anyone account otherwise for those sudden deaths which are no longer unfrequent in the world? A man, a woman, is to all appearances in perfect health. He or she was last seen by a friend who describes the conversation accurately and expresses astonishment at the catastrophe which followed so closely upon the visit. He or she is found alone by a servant or a third person in profound lethargy from which neither restoratives nor violent shocks upon the nerves can produce any awakening. In one hour or a few hours, it is over. There is an examination, and the authorities pronounce an ambiguous verdict. Death from syncope of the heart. Such things happen, they say, with a shake of the head. And indeed, they know that such things really do happen, and they suspect that they do not happen naturally, but there is no evidence not even so much as may be detected in a clever case of vegetable poisoning. The heart has stopped beating, and death has followed. There are wise men by score today who do not ask what made it stop, but who made it stop. But they have no evidence to bring, and the new jurisprudence, which in some countries covers the cases of thefts and frauds committed under hypnotic suggestion, cannot as yet lay down a law for cases where a man has been told to die and dies from weakness of the heart. And yet it is known, and well known, that by hypnotic suggestion the pulse can be made to fall to the lowest number of beatings consistent with life, and that the temperature of a body can be commanded beforehand to stand at a certain degree, and a fraction of a degree, at a certain hour, high or low, as may be desired. Let those who do not believe read accounts of what is done from day to day in the great European seats of learning. Accounts which everyone bears the name of some man speaking with authority and responsible to the world of science for every word he speaks, and doubly so for every word he writes. A few believe in the antiquated doctrine of electric animal currents. The vast majority are firm in the belief that the influence is a moral one. All admit that whatever force or influence lies at the root of hypnotism, the effects it can produce are practically unlimited, terrible in their comprehensiveness, and almost entirely unprovided for in the scheme of modern criminal law. And Norna was sure of herself, and of her strength to perform what she contemplated. There lay the dark beauty in the corner of the sofa, where she had sat and talked so long, and told her last story, the story of her life, which was now to end. A few determined words spoken in her ear, a pressure of the hand upon the brow and the heart, and she would never wake again. She would lie there still until they found her, hour after hour, the pulse growing weaker and weaker, those delicate hands colder, the face more set. At the last, there would be a convulsive shiver of the queenly form, and that would be the end. The physicians and the authorities would come and would speak of a weakness of the heart, and there would be masses sung for her soul, and she would rest in peace. Her soul in peace. Anona stood still. Was that to be all her vengeance upon the woman who had stood between her and happiness? Was there to be nothing but that? Nothing but the painless passing of the pure young spirit from earth to heaven? Was no one to suffer for all of Anona's pain? It was not enough. There must be more than that, and yet what more? That was the question. What imaginable wealth of agony would be a just retribution for her existence? Anorna could lead her as she had led Israel Kafka through the life and death of a martyr, through a life of wretchedness and a death of shame. But then the moment must come at last, since this was to be a death indeed, and her spotless soul would be beyond Anorna's reach for ever. No. That was not enough. 
since she could not be allowed to live to be tormented, vengeance must follow her beyond the end of life. Nona stood still, and an awful light of evil came into her face. A thought of which the enormity would have terrified a common being had entered her mind and taken possession of it. Beatrice was in her power. Beatrice should die in mortal sin, and her soul would be lost for ever. For a long time she did not move, but stood looking down at the calm and lovely face of her sleeping enemy, devising a crime to be imposed upon her for her eternal destruction. Anorna was very superstitious, or the hideous scheme could never have presented itself to her. To her mind, the deed was everything, whatever it was to be, and the intention or the unconsciousness in the doing it could have nothing to do with the consequences to the soul of the doer. She made no theological distinctions. Beatrice should commit some terrible crime and should die in committing it. Then she would be lost, and the devils would do in hell the worst torment which Anorna could not do on earth. A crime, a robbery, a murder, it must be done in the convent. Norna hesitated, bending her brow and pouring in imagination over the dark catalogue of all imaginable evil. A momentary and vague terror cast its shadow on her thoughts. By some accident of connection between two ideas, her mind went back a month and reviewed as in a flash of light all that she had thought and done since that day. She could think calmly now of the deeds, which even she would not have dared then. She thought of the evening when she had cried aloud that she would give her soul to know the wanderer safe, of the quick answer that had followed, and of Keok Arabian's face. Was he a devil, indeed, as she sometimes fancied? And had there been a reality and a binding meaning in that contract? Keok Arabian, he indeed possessed the key to all evil. What would he have done with Beatrice? Would he make her rob the church, murder the abbess in her sleep? Bad, but not bad enough. Anorna started. A deed suggested itself. So hellish, so horrible in its enormity, so far beyond all conceivable human sin, that for one moment her brain reeled. She shuddered again and again, and groped for support, and leaned against the wall in a bodily weakness of terror. For one moment she, who feared nothing, was shaken by fear from head to foot, her face turned white, her knees shook, her sight failed her, her teeth chattered, her lips moved hysterically. But she was strong still. The thing she had sought had come to her suddenly. She set her teeth, and she thought of it again and again, till she could face the horror of it without quaking. Is there any limit? to the hardening of the human heart. The distant bells rang out the call to midnight prayer, and Anorna stopped and listened. She had not known how quickly time was passing, but it was better so. She was glad it was so late, and she said so to herself. But the evil smile that was sometimes in her face was not there now. She had thought a thought that had left a mark on her forehead, was there any reality in that jesting contract with Keorg Arabian? She must wait before she did the deed. The nuns would go down in the lighted church and kneel and pray before the altar. It would last some time, the midnight lessons, the psalms, the prayer, and she must be sure that all was quiet, for the deed could not be done in a room where Beatrice was sleeping. 
She was conscious of the time now, and every minute seemed an hour, and every second was full of that one deed, done over and over again before her eyes, until every awful detail of the awful whole was stamped indelibly upon her brain. She sat down now, and leaning forwards was watching the innocent woman, and wondering how she would look when she was doing it. But she was calm now, as she had felt that she had never been in her life. Her breath came evenly, her heart beat naturally. She thought connectedly of what she was about to do, but the time seemed endless. The distant clocks chimed the half hour, three quarters, past midnight. Still, she waited. At the stroke of one, she rose from her seat and standing beside Beatrice, laid her hand upon the dark brow. A few questions, a few answers followed. She must assure herself that her victim was in the right state to execute minutely all her commands. Then she opened the door upon the corridor and listened. Not a sound broke the intense stillness, and all was dark. The hanging lamps had been extinguished and the nuns had all returned from the midnight service to their cells. No one would be stirring until four o'clock and half an hour was all that Anorna needed. She took Beatrice's hand. The dark woman rose with half-closed eyes and set features. Anorna led her out into the dark passage. It is light here, Anorna said. You can see your way, but I am blind. Take my hand, so and lead me to the church by the nun's staircase. Make no noise. I do not know the staircase, said the sleeper in drowsy tones. Anorna knew the way well enough, but not wishing to take a light with her, she was obliged to trust herself to her victim, for whose vision there was no such thing as darkness unless Anorna willed it. Go as you went today, to the room where the balcony is, but do not enter it. The staircase is on the right of the door and leads into the choir. Go. Without hesitation, Beatrice led her out into the impenetrable gloom with a swift, noiseless footstep in the direction commanded, never wavering nor hesitating whether to turn to the right or the left, but walking as confidently as though in broad daylight. Anorna counted the turnings and knew there was no mistake. Beatrice was leading her unerringly towards the staircase. They reached it and began to descend the winding steps. Anorna, holding her leader by one hand, steadied herself with the other against the smooth curved wall, fearing at every moment lest she should stumble and fall in the total darkness. But Beatrice never faltered. To her... The way was as bright as though the noonday sun had shone before her. The stairs ended abruptly against the door. Beatrice stood still. She had received no further commands, and the impulse ceased. Draw back the bolt and take me into the church, said Anorna, who could see nothing, but who knew that the nuns fastened the door behind them when they returned into the convent. Beatrice obeyed without hesitation and led her forwards. They came out between the high carved seats of the choir, behind the high altar. The church was not quite as dark as the staircase and passages had been, and Anorna stood still for a moment. In some of the chapels, hanging lamps of silver were lighted, and their tiny flames spread a faint radiance upwards and sideways, though not downwards, sufficient to break the total obscurity to eyes accustomed for some minutes to no light at all. The church stood, too, on a little eminence in the city, where the air without was less murky and impenetrable with the night mists, and though there was no moon, the high upper windows of the nave were distinctly visible in the gloomy height, like great lancet-shaped patches of grey upon a black ground. In the dimness, all objects took vast and mysterious proportions. A huge giant reared its head against one of the pillars, crowned with a high-pointed crown, stretching out one great shadowy hand into the gloom. The tall pulpit was there, 
as Anorna knew, and the hand was the wooden crucifix, standing out in its extended socket. The black confessionals, too, took shape, like monster nuns kneeling in their heavy hoods and veils, with their heads inclined behind the fluted pilasters, just within the circle of the feeble chapel lights. Within the choir, the deep shadows seemed to fill the carved stalls with the black ghosts of long-dead sisters, returned to their familiar seats out of the damp crypt below. The great lectern in the midst of the half-circle behind the high altar became a hideous skeleton, headless, its straight arms folded on its bony breast. The back of the high altar itself was a great throne, whereon sat in judgment a misty being of awful form, judging the dead women all through the lonely night. The stillness was appalling. Not a rat stirred. The Norna shuddered. Not at what she saw, but at what she felt. She had reached the place, and the doing of the deed was at hand. Beatrice stood beside her erect, asleep, motionless, her dark face just outlined in the surrounding dusk. Nonna took her hand and led her forwards. She could see now, and the moment had come. She brought Beatrice before the high altar and made her stand in front of it. Then she herself went back and groped for something in the dark. It was the pair of small wooden steps upon which the priest mounts in order to open the golden door of the high tabernacle above the altar when it is necessary to take therefrom the sacred host for the benediction or other consecrated wafers for the administration of the communion. To all Christians of all denominations whatsoever, the bread wafer, when once consecrated, is a holy thing. To Catholics and Lutherans, there is there substantially the presence of God. No imaginable act of sacrilege can be more unpardonable than the desecration of the tabernacle and the willful defilement and the destruction of the sacred host. This was Anorna's determination. Beatrice should commit this crime against heaven and then die with the whole weight of it upon her soul, and thus should her soul itself be tormented for ever and ever to ages of ages. Considering what she believed, it is no wonder that she should have shuddered at the tremendous thought and yet, in the distortion of her reasoning, the sin would be upon Beatrice who did the act, and not upon herself who commanded it. There was no diminution of her own faith in the sacredness of the place, and the holiness of the consecrated object. Had she been one whit less sure of that, her vengeance would have been vain, and her whole scheme meaningless. She came back out of the darkness and set the wooden steps in their place before the altar at Beatrice's feet. Then, as though to save herself from all participation in the guilt of the sacrilege which was to follow, she withdrew outside the communion rail and closed the gate behind her. Beatrice, obedient to her smallest command and powerless to move or act without her suggestion, stood as she had been placed with her back to the church and her face to the altar. Above her head, the richly wrought door of the tabernacle caught what little light there was and reflected it from its own uneven surface. Anorna paused for a moment, looked at the shadowy figure and then glanced behind her into the body of the church, not out of any ghostly fear, but to assure herself that she was alone with her victim. She saw that all was quite ready, and then she calmly knelt down just upon one side of the gate and rested her folded hands upon the marble rail. A moment of intense stillness followed. Again, the thought of Keorg Arabian flashed across her mind. Had there been any reality, she vaguely wondered, in that compact made with him? What was he doing now? But the crime was to be Beatrice's, not hers. Her heart beat fast for a moment, 
and then she grew very calm again. The clock in the church tower chimed the first quarter past one. She was able to count the strokes and was glad to find that she had lost no time. As soon as the long singing echo of the bells had died away, she spoke, not loudly, but clearly and distinctly. Beatrice Varanga, go forward and mount the steps I have placed for you. The dark figure moved obediently, and Anorna heard the slight sound of Beatrice's foot upon wood. The shadowy form rose higher and higher in the gloom and stood upon the altar itself. Now, do as I command you. Open the wide door of the tabernacle. It seemed to stretch out its hand, as though searching for something, and then the arm fell again to the side. Do as I command you! Norna repeated with the angry and dominant intonation that always came into her voice when she was not obeyed. Again the hand was raised for a moment, groped in the darkness, and sank down into the shadow. Beatrice Varanga, you must do my will. I order you to open the door of the tabernacle, to take out what is within, and to throw it to the ground. Her voice rang clearly through the church. And may the crime be on your soul for ever and ever, she added in a low voice. A third time the figure moved. A strange flash of light played for a moment upon the tabernacle. The effect, Anorna thought, of the gold door being suddenly opened. But she was wrong. The figure moved indeed and stretched out a hand and moved again. A sudden crash of something very heavy falling upon stone broke the great stillness. The dark form tottered, reeled, and fell to its length upon the great altar. Anorna saw that the golden door was still closed and that Beatrice had fallen. Unable to move or act by her own free judgment, and compelled by Anorna's determined command, she had made a desperate effort to obey. Anorna had forgotten that there was a raised step upon the altar itself, and that there were other obstacles in the way, including heavy candlesticks and the framed cannon of the mass, all of which are usually set aside before the tabernacle is opened by the priest. In attempting to do as she had told, the sleeping woman had stumbled, had overbalanced herself, had clutched one of the great silver candlesticks so that it fell heavily beside her, and then, having no further support, she had fallen herself. Anorna sprang to her feet and hastily opened the gate of the railing. In a moment, she was standing by the altar at Beatrice's head. She could see that the dark eyes were open now. The great shock had recalled her to consciousness. "'Where am I?' she asked in great distress, seeing nothing in the darkness now and groping with her hands. "'Sleep. Be silent and sleep.' said Anorna in low, firm tones, pressing her palm upon the forehead. No, no, cried the startled woman in a voice of horror. No, I will not sleep. No, do not touch me. Oh, where am I? Help, help. She was not hurt. With one strong, lithe movement, she sprang to the ground and stood with her back to the altar, her hands stretched out to defend herself from Anorna. But Anorna knew what extreme danger she was in if Beatrice left the church awake and conscious of what had happened. She seized the moving arms and tried to hold them down, pressing her face forward so as to look into the dark eyes she could but faintly distinguish. It was no easy matter, however, for Beatrice was young and strong and active. Then all at once she began to see Anorna's eyes as Anorna could see hers and she felt the terrible influence stealing over her again. No, 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 she cried, struggling desperately. You shall not make me sleep. I will not. I will not. There was a flash of light again in the church, this time from behind the high altar, and the noise of quick footsteps. But neither Anorna nor Beatrice noticed the light or the sound. Then the full glow of a strong lamp fell upon the faces of both and dazzled them, and Anorna felt a cool, thin hand upon her own. Sister Paul was beside them, her face very white, and her faded eyes turning from one to the other. It was very simple. Soon after Compline was over, the nun had gone to Anorna's room, had knocked and entered. To her surprise, Anorna was not there, but Sister Paul imagined that she had lingered over her prayers and would soon return. The good nun had sat down to wait for her, 
and telling her beads had fallen asleep. The unaccustomed warmth and comfort of the guest room had been too much for the weariness that constantly oppressed a constitution broken with ascetic practices. Accustomed by long habit to awake at midnight to attend the service, her eyes opened of themselves, indeed, but a full hour later than usual. She heard the clock strike one, and for a moment she could not believe her senses. Then she understood that she had been asleep, and was amazed to find that Anorna had not come back. She went out hastily into the corridor. The lay sister had long ago extinguished the hanging lamp, but Sister Paul saw light streaming from Beatrice's open door. She went in and called aloud. The bed had not been touched. Beatrice was not there. Sister Paul began to think that both the ladies must have gone to the midnight service. The corridors were dark, and they might have lost their way. She took the lamp from the table and went to the balcony at which the guests performed the devotion. It had been her light that had flashed across the door of the tabernacle. She had looked down to the choir and far below her had seen a figure, unrecognisable from that height in the dusk of the church, but clearly the figure of a woman standing upon the altar. Visions of horror rose before her eyes of sacrilegious practices of witchcraft, for she had thought of nothing else during the whole evening. Lamp in hand, she descended the stairs to the choir and reached the altar, providentially, just in time to save Beatrice from falling a victim again to the evil fascination of the enemy who had planned the destruction of her soul as well as her body. "'What is this? What are you doing in this holy place at this hour?' asked Sister Paul solemnly and sternly. Anorna folded her arms and was silent. No possible explanation of the struggle presented itself, even to her quick intellect. She fixed her eyes on the nun's face, concentrating all her will, for she knew that unless she could control her also, she herself was lost. Beatrice answered the question, drawing herself up proudly against the great altar and pointing at Anorna with her outstretched hand, her dark eyes flashing indignantly. We were talking together, this woman and I. She looked at me, she was angry, and then I fainted or fell asleep. I can't tell which. I awoke in the dark to find myself lying upon the altar here. Then she took hold of me and tried to make me sleep again, but I would not. Let her explain herself what she has done, and why she brought me here. Sister Paul turned to Anorna, and met the full glare of the unlike eyes, with her own calm, half-heavenly look of innocence. What have you done, Anorna? What have you done? she asked very sadly. But Anorna did not answer. She only looked at the nun more fixedly and savagely. She felt that she might as well have looked upon some ancient picture of a saint in heaven and bid it close its eyes. But she would not give up the attempt, for her only safety lay in its success. For a long time, Sister Paul returned her gaze steadily. Sleep, said Anorna, pushing up her hand. Sleep, I command you. But Sister Paul's eyes did not waver. A sad smile played for a moment upon her waxen features. You have no power over me, for your power is not of good, she said slowly and softly. Then she quietly turned to Beatrice and took her hand. Come with me, my daughter, she said. I have a light and will take you to a place where you will be safe. She will not trouble you any more tonight. Say a prayer, my child, and do not be afraid. I'm not afraid, said Beatrice, but where is she? she asked suddenly. Anorna had glided away while they were speaking. Sister Paul held the lamp high and looked in all directions. Then she heard the heavy door of sacristy swing upon its hinges and strike with a soft thud against the small leathern cushion. Both women followed her, but as they opened the door again, a blast of cold air almost extinguished the lamp. The night wind was blowing in from the street. She is gone out said Sister Paul. Alone and at this hour, heaven help her. It was as she said, Anorna had escaped.
End of chapter 20. Recording by Georgia Bondi, London, England, georgiabondi.com. Chapter 21 of The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Witch of Prague, A Fantastic Tale by Francis Marion Crawford. Chapter 21 after leaving Unorna at the convent, the wanderer had not hesitated as to the course he should pursue. It was quite clear that the only person to whom he could apply at the present juncture was Keyork Arabian. Had he been at liberty to act in the most natural and simple way, he would have applied to the authorities for a sufficient force with which to take Israel Kafka into custody as a dangerous lunatic. He was well aware, however, that such a proceeding must lead to an inquiry of a more or less public nature, of which the consequences might be serious, or at least extremely annoying to Unorna. Of the inconvenience to which he might himself be exposed, he would have taken little account, though his position would have been as difficult to explain as any situation could be. The important point was to prevent the possibility of Unorna's name being connected with an open scandal every present circumstance in the case was directly or indirectly the result of Unorna's unreasoning passion for himself, and it was clearly his duty, as a man of honour, to shield her from the consequences of her own acts, as far as lay in his power. He did not indeed believe literally all that she had told him in her mad confession. Much of that, he was convinced, was but a delusion. It might be possible, indeed, for Unorna to produce forgetfulness of such a dream as she impressed upon Kafka's mind in the cemetery of that same afternoon, or even perhaps of some real circumstance of merely relative importance in a man's life. But the wanderer could not believe that it was in her power to destroy the memory of the great passion through which she pretended that he himself had passed. He smiled at the idea, for he had always trusted his own senses and his own memory. Unorna's own mind was clearly wandering, or else she had invented the story, supposing him credulous enough to believe it. In either case it did not deserve a moment's consideration except as showing to what lengths her foolish and ill-bestowed love could lead her. Meanwhile she was in danger. She had aroused the violent and deadly resentment of Israel Kafka, a man who, if not positively insane, as Keyork Arabian had hinted, was by no means in a normal state of mind or body, a man beside himself with love and anger, and absolutely reckless of life for the time being, a man who, for the security of all concerned, must be at least temporarily confined in a place of safety, until a proper treatment and the lapse of a certain length of time should bring him to his senses. For the present he was wholly untractable, being at the mercy of the most uncontrolled passions, and of one of those intermittent phases of blind fatalism to which the Semitic races are peculiarly subject. There were two reasons which determined the wanderer to turn to Keyork Arabian for assistance, besides his wish to see the bad business end quickly and without publicity. Keyork, so far as the wanderer was aware, was himself treating Israel Kafka's case, and would therefore know what to do, if anyone knew at all. Secondly, it was clear from the message which Unorna had left with the porter of her own house that she expected Keyork to come at any moment. He was then in immediate danger of being brought face to face with Israel Kafka without having received the least warning of his present condition, and it was impossible to say what the infuriated youth might do at such a moment. He had been shut up, caught in his own trap as it were, for some time, and his anger and madness might reasonably be supposed to have been aggravated rather than cooled by his unexpected confinement. It was as likely as not that he would use the weapon he carried upon the first person with whom he found himself face to face, especially if that person made any attempt to overpower and disarm him. The wanderer drove to Keyork Arabian's house, and, leaving his carriage to wait in case of need, 
ascended the stairs and knocked at the door. For some reason or other, Kayark would not have a bell in his dwelling, whether because, like Mahomet, he regarded the bell as the devil's instrument, or because he was really nervously sensitive to the sound of one nobody had ever discovered. The wanderer knocked, therefore, and Kayork answered the knock in person. "'My dear friend!' he exclaimed in his richest and deepest voice, as he recognized the wanderer. "'Come in. I am delighted to see you. You will join me at supper. This is good indeed.' He took his visitor by the arm and led him in. Upon one of the tables stood a round brass platter, covered, so far as it was visible, with Arabic inscriptions, and highly polished, one of those commonly used all over the East at the present day for the same purpose. Upon this were placed at random several silver bowls, mere hemispheres without feet, remaining in a convenient position by their own weight. One of these contained snowy rice, in that perfectly dry but tender state dear to the taste of Orientals. In another was a savory, steaming mess of tender capon, chopped in pieces with spices and aromatic herbs. A third contained a pure white curd of milk, and a fourth was heaped up with rare fruits. A flagon of bohemian glass, clear and bright as rock crystal, and covered with very beautiful traceries of black and gold, with a drinking vessel of the same design, stood upon the table beside the platter. "'My simple meal,' said Keorg, spreading out his hands and smiling pleasantly. "'You will share it with me. There will be enough for two. "'So far as I am concerned, I should say so,' the wanderer answered with a smile. "'But my business is rather urgent.' Suddenly he saw that there was a third person in the room and glanced at Keorg in surprise. "'I want to speak a few words with you alone,' he said. "'I would not trouble you, but not in the least, not in the least, my dear friend,' asseverated Keorg, motioning him to a chair beside the board. "'But we are not alone,' observed the wanderer, still standing and looking at the stranger. Keorg saw the glance and understood he broke into peals of laughter. That, he exclaimed presently, that is only the individual. He will not disturb us. Pray be seated. I assure you that my business is very private, the wanderer objected. Quite so, of course. But there is nothing to fear. The individual is my servant, a most excellent creature, who has been with me for many years. He cooks for me, cleans the specimens, and takes care of me in all ways. A most reliable man, I assure you." Of course, if you can answer for his discretion. The individual was standing a little distance from the table observing the two men intently, but respectfully with his keen little black eyes. The rest of his square, dark face expressed nothing. He had perfectly straight, jet-black hair, which hung evenly all around his head and flat against his cheeks. He was dressed entirely in a black robe of the nature of a caftan, gathered closely round his waist by a black girdle, and fitting tightly over his stalwart shoulders. "'His discretion is beyond all doubt,' Keorg answered, "'and for the best of all reasons. He is totally deaf and dumb and absolutely illiterate. I brought him years ago in Astrakhan of a Russian friend. He is very clever with his fingers. It is he who stole from me the Malayan lady's head over there, after she was executed. And now, my dear friend, let us have supper." There were neither plates nor knives nor forks upon the table, and at a sign from Keorg, the individual retired to procure those western encumbrances to eating. The wanderer, acquainted as he had long been with his host's eccentricities, showed little surprise, but understood that whatever he said would not be overheard any more than if they had been alone. He hesitated a moment, however, for he had not determined exactly how far it was necessary to acquaint Keorg with the circumstances, and he was anxious to avoid all reference to Unorna's folly in regard to himself. The individual returned, bringing, with other things, a drinking-glass for the wanderer. Keorg filled it and then filled his own. It was clear that ascetic practices formed no part of his scheme for the prolongation of life. 
As he raised his glass to his lips, his bright eyes twinkled. To Keorg's long life and happiness, he said calmly, and then sipped the wine. And now for your story, he added, brushing the brown drops from his white mustache with a small damask napkin which the individual presented to him and immediately received again, to throw it aside as unfit for a second use. I hardly think that we can afford to linger over supper, the wanderer said, noticing Keorg's coolness with some anxiety. The case is urgent. Israel Kafka has lost his head completely. He has sworn to kill Unorna, and is at the present moment confined in the conservatory in her house." The effect of the announcement upon Keorg was so extraordinary that the wanderer started not being prepared for any manifestation of what seemed to be the deepest emotion. The gnome sprang from the table with a cry that would have been like the roar of a wounded wild beast if it had not articulated a terrific blasphemy. "'Unorna is quite safe,' the wanderer hastened to say. "'Safe? Where?' shouted the little man, his hands already on his furs. The individual too had sprung across the room like a cat and was helping him. In five seconds Keorg would have been out of the house. In a convent. I took her there, and saw the gate close behind her." Keorg dropped his furs and stood still a moment. The individual, always unmoved, rearranged the coat and cap neatly in their place, following all his master's movements, however, with his small eyes. Then the sage broke out in a different strain. He flung his arms round the wanderer's body and attempted to embrace him. You have saved my life! The curse of the three black angels on you for not saying so first!" he cried in agony of ecstasy. Preserver, what can I do for you? Saviour of my existence, how can I repay you? You shall live forever, as I will. You shall have all my secrets. The gold spider shall spin her web in your dwelling. The part of fortune shall shine on your path. It shall rain jewels on your roof and your winter shall have snows of pearls, you shall—" "'Good heavens, Keorg!' interrupted the wanderer. "'Are you mad? What is the matter with you?' "'Mad? The matter? I love you! I worship you! I adore you! You have saved her life, and you have saved mine! You have almost killed me with fright and joy in two moments! You have—' "'Be sensible, Keorg. You Norna is quite safe but we must do something about Kafka, and—' The rest of his speech was drowned in another shout from the gnome, ending in a portentous peal of laughter. He had taken his glass again and was toasting himself. "'To Keorg, to his long life, to his happiness!' he cried. Then he wet his lips again in the golden juice, and the individual, unmoved, presented him with a second napkin. The wine seemed to steady him, and he sat down again in his place. "'Come,' he said, "'let us eat first. I have an amazing appetite, and Israel Kafka can wait.' "'Do you think so? Is it safe?' the wanderer asked. "'Perfectly,' returned Keorg, growing quite calm again. "'The locks are very good on those doors. I saw to them myself.' "'But someone else—' "'There is no someone else.' interrupted the sage sharply. Only three persons can enter the house without question, you, I, and Kafka. You and I are here, and Kafka is there already. When we have eaten we will go to him, and I flatter myself that the last state of the young man will be so immeasurably worse than the first, that he will not recognize himself when I have done with him." He had helped his friend and began eating. Somewhat reassured, the wanderer followed his example. Under the circumstances, it was as well to take advantage of the opportunity for refreshment. No one could tell what might happen before morning. "'It just occurs to me,' said Keorg, fixing his keen eyes on his companion's face, "'that you have told me absolutely nothing, except that Kafka is mad and that Unorna is safe.' "'Those are the most important points,' observed the wanderer. "'Precisely but I am sure that you will not think me indiscreet if I wish to know a little more. For instance, what was the immediate cause of Kafka's extremely theatrical and unreasonable rage? 
that would interest me very much. Of course he is mad, poor boy, but I take delight in following out the workings of an insane intellect. Now there are no phases of insanity more curious than those in which the patient is possessed with a desire to destroy what he loves best. These cases are especially worthy of study, because they happen so often in our day." The wanderer saw that some explanation was necessary, and he determined to give one in as few words as possible. Unorna and I had strolled into the Jewish cemetery, he said. While we were talking there, Israel Kafka suddenly came upon us and spoke and acted very wildly. He is madly in love with her. She became very angry and would not let me interfere. Then, by way of punishment for his intrusion, I suppose, she hypnotized him and made him believe that he was Simon Abelus, and brought the whole of the poor boy's life so vividly before me, as I listened, that I actually seemed to see the scenes. I was quite unable to stop her or to move from where I stood, though I was quite awake. But I realized what was going on, and I was disgusted at her cruelty to the unfortunate man. He fainted at the end, but when he came to himself he seemed to remember nothing. I took him home and Unorna went away by herself. Then he questioned me so closely as to what had happened that I was weak enough to tell him the truth. Of course, as a fervent Hebrew, which he seems to be, he did not relish the idea of having played the Christian martyr for Unorna's amusement, and amidst the graves of his own people. He there and then impressed me that he intended to take Unorna's life without delay, but insisted that I should warn her of her danger, saying that he would not be a common murderer. Seeing that he was mad and in earnest, I went to her. There was some delay which proved fortunate, as it turned out, for we left the conservatory by the small door just as he was entering from the other end. We locked it behind us and going round by the passages locked the other door upon him also, so that he was caught in a trap. And there he is, unless someone has let him out." "'And then you took Unorna to the convent?' Keyork had listened attentively. I took her to the convent, promising to come to her when she should send for me. Then I saw that I must consult you before doing anything more. It would not do to make a scandal of the matter." No answered Keyork thoughtfully. It will not do." The wanderer had told his story with perfect truth, and yet in a way which entirely concealed the very important part Unorna's passion for him had played in the sequence of events. Seeing that Keyork asked no further questions, he felt satisfied that he had accomplished his purpose as he had intended, and that the sage suspected nothing. He would have been very much disconcerted had he known that the latter had long been aware of Unorna's love, and was quite able to guess at the cause of Kafka's sudden appearance and extreme excitement. Indeed, so soon as he had finished the short narrative, his mind reverted with curiosity to Keyork himself, and he wondered what the little man had meant by his amazing outburst of gratitude on hearing of Unorna's safety. Perhaps he loved her. More impossible things than that had occurred in the wanderer's experience. Or possibly he had an object to gain in exaggerating his thankfulness to Unorna's preserver. He knew that Keyork rarely did anything without an object, and that, although he was occasionally very odd and excitable, he was always in reality perfectly well aware of what he was doing. He was roused from his speculations by Keyork's voice. There will be no difficulty in securing Kafka, he said. The real question is, what shall we do with him? He is very much in the way at present, and he must be disposed of at once, or we shall have more trouble. How infinitely more to the purpose it would have been if he had wisely determined to cut his own throat instead of Unorna's! But young men are so thoughtless. I will only say one thing, said the wanderer and then I will leave the direction to you. The poor fellow has been driven mad by Unorna's caprice and cruelty. I am determined that he shall not be made to suffer gratuitously anything more." "'Do you think that Unorna was intentionally cruel to him?' inquired Keyork. "'I can hardly believe that. She has not a cruel nature.' "'You would have changed your mind if you had seen her this afternoon 
but that is not the question. I will not allow him to be ill-treated." "'No, no, of course not,' Keyork answered with eager assent. "'But, of course, you will understand that we have to deal with a dangerous lunatic, and that it may be necessary to use whatever means are most sure and certain.' "'I shall not quarrel with your means,' the wanderer said quietly, "'provided that there is no unnecessary brutality. If I see anything of the kind, I will take the matter into my own hands.' "'Certainly, certainly,' said the other, eyeing with curiosity the man who spoke so confidently of taking out of Keyork Arabian's grasp whatever had once found its way into it. "'He shall be treated with every consideration,' the wanderer continued. Of course, if he is very violent, we shall have to use force." "'We will take the individual with us,' said Keyork. He is very strong. He has a trick of breaking silver florins with his thumbs and fingers which is very pretty. I fancy that you and I could manage him. It is a pity that neither of us has the faculty of hypnotizing. This would be the proper time to use it." "'A great pity. But there are other things that will do almost as well. What, for instance? A little ether in a sponge. He would only struggle a moment, and then he would be much more really unconscious than if he had been hypnotized. Is it quite painless? Quite, if you give it gradually. If you hurry the thing, the man feels as though he were being smothered. But the real difficulty is what to do with him, as I said before. Take him home and get a keeper from the lunatic asylum the wanderer suggested. Then comes the whole question of an inquiry into his sanity, objected Keyork. We come back to the starting point. We must settle all this before we go to him. A lunatic asylum is not a club in this country. There is a great deal of formality connected with getting into it, and a great deal more connected with getting out. Now, I could not get a keeper for Kafka without going to the physician in charge and making a statement, and demanding an examination and all the rest of it. And Israel Kafka is a person of importance among his own people. He comes of great Jews in Moravia, and we should have the whole Jews' quarter, which means nearly the whole of Prague, in a broad sense, about our ears in twenty-four hours. No, no, my friend. To avoid an enormous scandal things must be done very quietly indeed. I cannot see anything to be done, then, unless we bring him here," said the wanderer, falling into the trap from sheer perplexity. Everything that Keyork had said was undeniably true. "'He would be a nuisance in the house,' answered the sage, not wishing, for reasons of his own, to appear to accept the proposition too eagerly. "'Not but that the individual would make a capital keeper. He is as gentle as he is strong and as quick as a tiger-cat." "'So far as that is concerned,' said the wanderer coolly, "'I could take charge of him myself, if you did not object to my presence.' "'You do not trust me,' said the other, with a sharp glance. "'My dear Keyork, we are old acquaintances, and I trust you implicitly to do whatever you have predetermined to do for the advantage of your studies, unless someone interferes with you. You have no more respect for human life or sympathy for human suffering than you have belief in the importance of anything not conducive to your researches. I am perfectly well aware that if you thought you could learn something by making experiments upon the body of Israel Kafka, you would not scruple to make a living mummy of him, you would do it without the least hesitation. I should expect to find him with his head cut off, living by means of a glass heart and thinking through a rabbit's brain. That is the reason why I do not trust you. Before I could deliver him into your hands, I would require of you a contract to give him back unhurt, and a contract of the kind you would consider binding." Keyork Arabian wondered whether Unorna, in the recklessness of her passion, had betrayed the nature of the experiment they had been making together, but a moment's reflection told him that he need have no anxiety on this score. He understood the wanderer's nature too well to suspect him of wishing to convey a covert hint instead of saying openly what was in his mind. "'Taste one of these oranges,' he said, by way of avoiding an answer. "'They have just come from Smyrna. 
The wanderer smiled as he took the proffered fruit. "'So that, unless you have a serious objection to my presence,' he said, continuing his former speech, "'you will have me as a guest so long as Israel Kafka is here.' Keyork Arabian saw no immediate escape. "'My dear friend!' he exclaimed with alacrity. "'If you are really in earnest, I am as really delighted. So far from taking your distrust ill, I regard it as a providentially fortunate bias of your mind, since it will keep us together for a time. You will be the only loser. You see how simply I live." "'There is a simplicity which is the extremest development of refined Sybarism,' the wanderer said, smiling again. I know your simplicity of old. It consists of getting precisely what you want and in producing local earthquakes and revolutions when you cannot get it. Moreover, you want what is good, to the taste at least." "'There is something in that,' answered Keorg, with a merry twinkle in his eye. "'Happiness is a matter of speculation. Comfort is a matter of fact. Most men are uncomfortable, because they do not know what they want. If you have tastes, study them. If you have intelligence, apply it to the question of gratifying your tastes. Consult yourself first, and nobody second. Consider this orange. I am fond of oranges, and they suit my constitution admirably. Consider the difficulty I have had in procuring it at this time of year, not in the wretched condition in which they are sold in the market, plucked half green in Spain or Italy and ripened on the voyage in the fermenting heat of the decay of those which are already rotten, but ripe from the tree and brought to me directly by the shortest and quickest means possible. Consider this orange, I say. Do you vainly imagine that if I had but two or three like it I would offer you one? I would not be so rash as to imagine anything of the kind, my dear Keorg. I know you very well. If you offer me one, it is because you have a week supply at least." Exactly, said Keorg, and a few despair, because they will only keep a week as I like them, and because I would no more run the risk of missing my orange a week hence for your sake than I would deprive myself of it today. And that is your simplicity. That is my simplicity. It is indeed a perfectly simple matter, for there is only one idea in it and in all things I carry that one idea out to its ultimate expression. That one idea, as you very well put it, is to have exactly what I want in this world. And you will be getting what you want in having me quartered upon you as poor Israel Kafka's keeper? asked the wanderer, with an expression of amusement. But Keorg did not wince. Precisely, he answered without hesitation. In the first place, you will relieve me of much trouble and responsibility, and the individual will not be so often called away from his manifold and important household duties. In the second place, I shall have a most agreeable and intelligent companion with whom I can talk as long as I like. In the third place, I shall undoubtedly satisfy my curiosity." "'In what respect, if you please?' I shall discover the secret of your wonderful interest in Israel Kafka's welfare. I always like to follow the workings of a brain essentially different from my own, philanthropic, of course. How could it be anything else? Philanthropy deals with a class of ideas wholly unfamiliar to me. I shall learn much in your society." "'And possibly I shall learn something from you,' the wanderer answered. "'There is certainly much to be learnt. I wonder whether your ideas upon all subjects are as simple as those you hold about oranges. Absolutely. I make no secret of my principles. Everything I do is for my own advantage." Then, observed the wanderer, the advantage of Unorna's life must be an enormous one to you, to judge by your satisfaction at her safety. Keorg stared at him a moment and then laughed but less heartily and loudly than usual his companion fancied. "'Very good!' he exclaimed. "'Excellent! I fell into the trap like a rat into a basin of water. You are indeed an interesting companion, my dear friend. So interesting that I hope we shall never part again.' There was a rather savage intonation in the last words. 
they looked at each other intently, neither wincing nor lowering his gaze. The wanderer saw that he had touched upon Keorg's greatest and most important secret, and Keorg fancied that his companion knew more than he actually did. But nothing further was said, for Keorg was far too wise to enter into explanation, and the wanderer knew well enough that if he was to learn anything it must be by observation and not by questioning. Keorg filled both glasses in silence, and both men drank before speaking again. "'And now that we have refreshed ourselves,' he said, returning naturally to his former manner, "'we will go and find Israel Kafka. It is as well that we should have given him a little time to himself. He may have returned to his senses without any trouble on our part. Shall we take the individual?' "'As you please,' the wanderer answered indifferently as he rose from his place. "'It is very well for you not to care,' observed Keorg. You are big and strong and young, whereas I am a little man and very old at that. I shall take him for my own protection. I confess that I value my life very highly. It is part of that simplicity which you despise. That devil of a Jew is armed, you say? I saw something like a knife in his hand as we shut him in, said the wanderer with the same indifference as before. Then I will take the individual," Keorg answered promptly. A man's bare hands must be strong and clever to take a man's life in a scuffle, and few men can use a pistol to any purpose. But a knife is a weapon of precision. I will take the individual, decidedly." He made a few rapid signs, and the individual disappeared, coming back a moment later attired in a long coat not unlike his master's except that the fur of the great collar was of a common fox instead of being of sable. Keorg drew his peaked cape comfortably down over the tips of his ears. "'The ether! he exclaimed. "'How forgetful I am growing! Your charming conversation had almost made me forget the object of our visit!' He went back and took the various things he needed. Then the three men went out together. End of chapter 21